Jessica, so if you could tell me a little bit about the Massachusetts Child Trauma Project. So the Massachusetts Child Trauma Project was a federally funded initiative um, supported by the Administration for Children and Families through um, Health and Human Services that was really intended to infuse trauma-informed care into child welfare and also mental health. You had mentioned trauma-informed care. What, what is that? Trauma-informed care has been defined in numerous ways, actually. But I think there are several main components to it. One is really the recognition of trauma, what it is, and the impact that it has on children's development and functioning. Another is having a sense of a shared language and approach among all of the different parties that are involved in a child's life. So that could be a family, foster families, in the case of child welfare, for example, caseworkers. Um, anyone really who is providing services to a child and who's caring for a child has an awareness of what it means to have experienced trauma. Looking at trauma not as what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And thinking about, well, what does that mean in terms of making sure that you're, you're presenting the right type of treatments and services that are trauma-informed, that are culturally sensitive, and that consider the use of evidence-based practices. I think it's really critical in terms of treatment and referral. Tell me what you and your colleagues studied. So in this particular study, we had two major components. One had to do with looking at treatment outcomes for children who were birthed to age 18, and trying to understand whether the use of evidence-based trauma treatments in particular, but in combination with all of the education we were doing in mental health and child welfare, which we can't really separate out because it was a larger intervention. But did those treatment outcomes actually reduce children's post-traumatic stress symptoms, reduce their behavioral problems, reduce their clinical needs, and also increase some of their personal strengths? How do you go about measuring that? There are some very good measures actually that are out there, particularly for older children. And so we did actually ask clinicians to use clinically relevant measures, which we decided with, with the actual mental health providers. Um, so to measure post-traumatic stress, so PTSD, um, and the majority met the clinical cutoff when they came in to treatment and we looked at something called the child behavior uh, checklist, which is a commonly used measure of children's behavior problems and had parents fill out that measure. And we had a couple of other standardized measures. About how many mm -hmm. children did you study? Ultimately, 842 children and youth were enrolled in the study, although far more were served. So those were the families that felt comfortable enrolling in the actual evaluation and sharing their data. But what did you find? Our findings were, um, as we had hoped, given that we had very specifically selected evidence-based or evidence-informed treatments, that there was a significant reduction in behavioral problems, significant reductions in um, trauma symptoms across the various symptom clusters, like avoidance and numbing we talk about, or intrusions like bad dreams, or, um, you know, kind of thoughts that get in your way. Uh, etc. and some of the um, other symptoms that come along with trauma. We saw really nice reductions and also clinical needs lessened and some of their personal strengths really improved over the course of time. You said some of their personal strengths mm -hmm. improved. Are you looking at a group of kids that were at risk if there were no interventions? Untreated, some children manage to bounce back when they've experienced mild forms of trauma. I think, you know, we know up to half of children experience at least one form of trauma by the time they reach the age of 18. And not everybody needs to go into treatment. But these were kids who were already in the child welfare system, right? So they already had significant adversities going on in their lives, many of whom were then separated from their parents, and they were in the foster care system and experienced multiple separation and loss experiences, so which we often, and often which start very early in childhood, which we tend to refer to as complex trauma, which is has um, much more negative outcomes in terms of long-term well-being in adolescence and adulthood. So we knew already that they had experienced child abuse and neglect and what comes with that. And then when we actually assessed at baseline how many different types of trauma they had exposure to, the average was 5.2. So we often think of these children as 
just having an abu you know, abuse or neglect experience when in fact they've experienced many more types of trauma. What do the findings of this study suggest? First, that trauma treatment when it is evidence-based, that is it's been tested and found to be effective with particular populations, um, that they really can make a difference in children and families' lives and that they are not the same as just going into therapy. And I think that's an important piece for, for folks to know that uh, sometimes regular therapy actually can be contraindicated because the typical therapist might go in and dive right into the trauma, whereas that might actually escalate things for a child who um, you know, has, has very recently or is still experiencing trauma. So I think we know very much that these can be effective and that when you add additional supports around it, from other service providers and foster parents and other people who really understand trauma, that outcomes can look quite good quite quickly because we were able to find these results within the space of six months. What are the parent takeaways for someone who's watching this who, who may know of a family or, or be in a situation where there is some trauma? You know, one parent said to me that had she known what she knew after she took a parenting course on trauma, um, that she would have done things entirely differently. And she said actually that she went into the bathroom and cried because had she known what to have done, she would have been done it, doing it all along and that she had felt very alone. And that's what we don't want parents to feel, foster parents, um, you know, biological parents, care, you know, grandparents, whomever is caring for a child. They're not alone. There are treatments out there. There are trainings out there that really can, can be supportive and really get you through the days of what you think of as, as difficult behavior. Do you have any specific behaviors or specific tips for parents? Right, so this is a population of families who are involved with the child welfare system. So by definition, they're involved in a system that has access to different types of treatments and services in the community. Uh, and so one thing is to ask about the types of services that are available and not just for their children but also themselves so that they can feel confident um, and learn strategies of self-care, right? Because this is really difficult work. These are, it's not the same to spend a day with a child who's experienced trauma than your average child who grows up. It's much more stressful and so there are all these supports around and in particular to ask whether these are <coughs> support services particularly to ask whether these are supports and services and treatments that have been tested and that have been found to be effective. Are there any other uh, tips or any other suggestions? For parents, yes, I mean I think social support and self-care are really critical and so any parent or foster parent who is doing you know this important work of taking care of children who has experienced sometimes the same trauma that the parent or caregiver has experienced, right? If it's a home in which there's domestic violence or there's been a car accident or they're both in war, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's um, we often kind of say flippantly that, oh, parents should take care of themselves before they take care of their children. But what we really have found through research is it's actually quite important that parents' well of resources are full enough so that they have the extra psychological energy um, in order to be able to provide proper care for their children. So that means taking time to themselves, getting respite care if they need it, um, looking to uh, others for support, whether those are family members or whether it's a social group or a parenting group. Sometimes it can be a service like home visiting where you have a home visitor. Um, early intervention. There are many different services and so I often think of parents who don't natu have natural supports have because oftentimes child, uh, child abuse and neglect can be intergenerational. So you might not be able to depend on your own parents for support or your own family for support. What would be the next steps in research for, for you and your colleagues looking at these programs? I think one of the important next steps is to look at this in a more rigorous context. So we followed children over time during treatment and what we didn't do is set up a comparison group. So if we were really to set up a rigorous study then what we would do is compare children who received the services to those who didn't and that is often called a randomized control trial 
And that way you could really direct, directly attribute the findings to the actual program. We know they got better, and of course that's what's important. But in terms of understanding the particular trauma-informed care approach or the particular trauma treatment, uh, that would be the, the way to really further the evidence. Is Massachusetts the only state with this model? Could this be a national model for, for other states, or is it already? I think there are several states that have some really important and interesting trauma-informed care initiatives, and they all look a little different. And so part of what needs to happen is that we gather together and share what we're finding and so that we can create hybrids or find, identify the core elements that are necessary within trauma-informed care to produce the outcomes that we want to produce. Can you think of a couple of those core components? One of the things across the initiatives that I've seen is uh, the use of well-tested training uh, for foster parents, but also for caseworkers, also for leadership, that there's systemic buy-in. So when I say trauma-informed care, it's not as simple as training a parent, oh yes, parent, you know, the trauma is difficult and here are some strategies. That's important, but that's only part of the picture. So to be thinking about it systemically, that everyone in an agency and set of organizations and family members are all in on it, right? So I think that's a really, a really key element that I've seen in, in the initiatives that have been successful thus far. Another is really incorporating the voice of parents and youth themselves, which often is very difficult because they're busy, they're stressed, these are vulnerable families and hard to engage sometimes because of how much they have to do in their daily lives. But worth the work because they have a whole lot to tell us about what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And so as much as researchers we like to think that we know, you know, from the science about what people should doing, be doing and what works for families. We actually need to be asking families and also service providers. Can you tell me a little bit about Mary-Kate? So Mary-Kate um, was in the Mass Child Trauma Project and received uh, trauma treatment through that project. And she is really a remarkable example of some of the work that's gone on. She, was, she has the long history of difficult foster placements, of extensive trauma, um, to many experiences of separation and loss, and landed in a foster family who's a wonderful foster family but didn't have a lot of these tools. And so what happened was is that both of them simultaneously were able to learn about trauma together. Um, and so, and then in their own ways. So she threw clinical treatment where she got a really good therapist who was, who was using one of the trauma um, treatments that we trained mental health clinicians in for this project and finally felt like she found a place clinically that was really useful for her. And at the same time, her mother was taking, as a foster mother, was taking this course that was a well-developed course developed by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And so together, they were sort of coming together and bringing the concepts together and able to, to work really well. And she's managed to really become a productive, you know, and well-functioning member of society. When the program works the way it's intended, is it life-changing? Is it life-saving? How would you describe it? You know, I'm, as a researcher, I always tend to defer that comment to the people who experience it. I think they're the ones who should talk about how, what it's like for them. But I will say that through this work and others, that it is pretty remarkable the changes we've seen. I mean, one, the, one, another piece to the study was that we compared 91,000 children some of whom received the intervention and others who were still waiting to receive the intervention. And we found that there was a 15% reduction in child maltreatment. So if 15% fewer children are being maltreated, that has a long-term impact in terms of societal well-being, in terms of cost to society, and returns on our investment, and really can be described as life-changing. By maltreatment, could you just for what you're talking about? Maltreatment is often used as a catch-all for talking about all forms of child abuse and neglect, which anyone in the field and anyone who's experienced it will say every experience is different. It's not the same to be emotionally or psychologically abused as it is to be physically abused, as it is to be neglected. 
et cetera. So each experience of trauma, even just within child maltreatment, is unique. Over what period of time did you study those kids? And these results really are, were specific to six-month outcomes and 12-month outcomes. Partly that was determined by the nature of the intervention that they received, so that there were three trauma treatments. One was attachment, self-regulation, and competency. And that tends to be used with children who are kind of school-aged and up, and tends to be kind of short to moderate term treatment, and kind of when children have basically hit those three marks, right? Their, their attachments are looking good, they're self-regulated, and they're feeling pretty competent. But there are the two other models, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which is really quite intended to be a very short-term concrete model um, and has a very good evidence base. And for those kids, they were often done with treatment by six months. And then there's child-parent psychotherapy for our very youngest children, so infants and toddlers. And those children really work in a dyadic context, so meaning they're working with their caregivers and whether that's a parent or a foster parent or a grandparent, whomever is taking care of them. And, and that treatment is actually 12 to 18 months, so it's a much longer treatment. Is there anything I didn't ask you, Jessica, that you would want people to know about this project or about the study? I think one of the things that we found was that the, although the overall results were quite good across the board when we averaged it across all children and all, and all models, but when we started to break the models down, we started to see some differences. And so, for instance, we didn't, the project didn't have as strong an effect on reducing post-traumatic stress in very young children, in infants and toddlers. And that's obviously concerning since the best intervention is early intervention. So I think that's something that needs more attention. It may be because at those, at those ages, it's very difficult actually to assess trauma symptoms. They don't show up in the same way, you know. It might look like problems in attachment with you know, a caregiver. And, and we didn't use an attachment measure actually in this study. So one thing I would say is to improve our measures. There are not very good measures for your very young children who are suffering from, from trauma. Do you have any statistics on how many um, kids are in the system here in Massachusetts? Annually, it's typically you know, just under three quarters of a million children in the country. Uh, so, and then Massachusetts has higher rates than other states. Of course, we think that's partly because we surveil children more carefully and we have many supports and services compared to other places. So when you have kids who are in services, then service providers tend to report more often. But the area of social science you study? Really looking at risk and resilience in young children. Just a little bit about your background. If you could tell me where you got your undergraduate degree, your master's, and your advanced degrees. Sure, yes. I have an undergraduate in applied child development from Tufts University. And I have a master's in applied child development from Tufts University. I have a, an MSW, master's in social work, from Simmons College School of Social Work, and a PhD from Tufts University, also in applied child development.